Hello, good morning. Welcome to our final LDH talk of 2023. And what is uh, the topic of today's talk would be boosting manufacturing competitiveness through predictive maintenance, why and how. We have really exciting line of speakers today. However, I'll be your moderator. I'll be moderating the questions as well as the polls. My name is Sri, I work as advisor at Digital Innovation Hub. Before going to the webinar, I would like to give you some tips on how to use the tool. However, I would like to mention that this webinar is being recorded and a replay will be made available for Lux Innovation and uh, community through its YouTube channel. On your right side, you will see a panel with four tabs. The first tab is for the discussion. You could interact with other participants in this tab. And the second tab is specifically for questions. This would make the life of speakers and moderators easy to check for the questions and respond accordingly. And in the third tab, you have interactivity. That's where the polls for today will be published. And you, we, will have, we have three polls to answer at the beginning of each presentation. However, I would like to start actually by the first poll. The first poll is what is your biggest challenge in maintaining the reliability of your manufacturing equipment? I chose this poll specifically to understand the, understand the problems associated with um, maintenance equipment in manufacturing companies. So the poll is live now. Take a minute and please answer the poll. I see some people started already answering. Please go to interactivity and answer your poll. Thank you, I clearly see the trend. We have 20 more seconds. Please keep those answers coming in. All right, that's good. So I see that clearly minimizing maintenance cost is a priority followed by preventing unplanned downtime. Uh, let's keep the poll for live for now. People who join later could answer them. However, this is the time to introduce our esteemed speakers for today. We have an exciting line here, Felix, Marcelo, Dorian, Hari, and Surendran. When the speakers are speaking and if you have questions to them, Again, I remind you to put them in the space of questions. Don't put them into discussions. It will be difficult to fish them out at the end. Without any further ado, I would welcome our first presenter, Felix Saretsky. He's a doctoral researcher in predictive maintenance at the University of Luxembourg, as well as he works as an engineer at Imotech. I have had the privilege to see his presentation. And I must say that this presentation sets the base for all of you to bring you up to the speed of predictive maintenance. Um, and yeah, I wish you all good luck listening. And Felix, the floor is yours. Okay, so hello, good morning. Uh, and thank you, Sri, for your nice introduction. Um, as I will be giving the first presentation, uh, Joachim told me to give you a brief overview about predictive maintenance. Um, so here you can see my agenda for today. Um, I will start with uh, three different maintenance strategies and their approaches. Um, next, I will explain the data-driven method of predictive maintenance. In the third point, I will briefly touch uh, on the concepts of diagnostics and pro prognostics. And last but not least, I will tell you something about the current uh, industrial research problem I'm facing at uh, Imatech. Um, so maintenance strategies are general essential for, um, first of all, of course, ensuring equipment reliability and maximize op uh, operational efficiency. 
Um, there are also some leading questions like, is the maintenance scheduled? Um, is it a reactive or proactive repair action? Uh, what determines it, its effectiveness? And what are the possible savings or costs? Uh, on the right hand side, you can see a graph. I will briefly go over it in the next few slides. Um, <clears throat> so corrective or uh, reactive maintenance take actions after the equipment fails means that the manufacturing line or machine already failed. Mm, this causes high unexpected downtimes and you need to rely on the knowledge of your technicians and operators, which most of the times results in high costs for companies. Um, the preventive maintenance method is a method of performing regularly scheduled maintenance activities to help prevent unexpected failures in the future. Uh, put simply, it's about fixing before they break. Uh, but the problem here is, however, that it takes, or it is, is that it involves additional costs and an increased unexploited lifetime of machines or production plants. Um, the condition based maintenance CBM, on the other hand, is a strategy that monitors the actual condition of an asset to decide what maintenance needs to be done. Uh, CBM requires that maintenance should only be carried out if certain indicators show, for example, a decline in performance or an uh, imminent failure. CBM relies purely on real-time sensor measurements, as you can see on the picture below, below the text. Uh, these are some, some signals which we sampling uh, during the production. Then uh, predictive maintenance uses data analysis to detect oper operating anomalies and uh, potential equipment defects and enables timely repairs before uh, the failure occurs. Uh, it aims to minimize maintenance frequency and avoid unplanned downtimes. Um, so this method continuously monitors the condition indicators uh, of a device or a machine using uh, advanced statistical machine or deep learning methods. And their goal uh, is to find a pattern which is uh, most of the time uh, a nonlinear pattern. And the target is to timely predict developing and unexpected problems that you can fix them before they occur. So uh, after the short introduction, I, I will move on on the second point of my presentation, which deals with data-driven methods. So in general, the approaches can be divided into three categories, um, which are the knowledge-based methods and the data-driven methods, and also the hybrid one. But uh, I or we will focus in the next slides on the data-driven method, which are uh, rely on machine learning or, or stochastic stochastic methods or models. Um, so I will proceed now with the data-driven one. So to develop a data-driven predictive maintenance strategy, you need, of course, data. Uh, but what or which data sources are relevant? For example, this can be sensor data recording various signals like environmental, uh, physical, electrical, or mechanical signals. This could be also log data, which is uh, like maintenance logs or reports but also service data with details of performed services like the equipment, the cost, or information about technicians and operators. Uh, the next important question is uh, what data should be collected for creating the equipment health indicator? And this could be based on um, many factors, for example, internal conditions, like performing failure mode and effective analysis to find it out, an external condition like yeah, checking the parameters which affect affect the functioning of the equipment, uh, but also be uh, you need to prepare for dealing with uh, low quality data, right? Uh, but collecting large amount of normal operational operation data is relatively easy, but however, this data is generally far from fully representative. So um, we need faulty data. And this causes sometimes some problems because failures are usually rare events that take time to develop, or you need to perform run to failure um, tests or yeah, tests which are very expensive. 
Also, a fault injection does not embrace all situations, of course, and it's hard to know um, all the of all the possible faults which could be exist in this machine or production line. Uh, therefore, the predictive maintenance models are expected to get better at predicting downtimes or breakdowns over the time when you're implementing these. Uh, the third point of the presentation deals uh, with diagnostics and prognostics. So um, if, we, if we're starting with diagnostics, we have methods like anomaly detection, uh, which monitors normally unusual machine behavior and giving warnings earlier. But the challenges here are uh, that we have high dimensional and non-stationary data, most of the time time series data, and the sensor data is typically uh, of poor quality and with a lot of noise. Uh, on the other hand, we have root cause analysis, um, which try to find what went wrong and where in complex setups. But also the challenges here are you can have multiple causes uh, like degradation, uh, misuse, or even an accident. And different faults may have similar symptoms, uh, but could have different root causes. So in summary, uh, they help to monitor the current condition to clarify the what and the why. In prognostics, on the other hand, uh, we have methods like the remaining useful life forecasting, which tells you how long a machine can work before it's likely to break or to fail. The challenges here are that it depends highly on high quality historical data and the remaining useful life uh, ident the identical or based on this, the identical systems can fluctuate under the similar operation conditions. Um, so, so far, uh, yeah, we have learned that predictive maintenance optimizes or can optimize the uptime of an industri industrial plant or machine uh, by predicting the failures before they occur. But um, however, the, the complexity of the current machine learning models make them difficult to understand. For example, leaving professionals without insights uh, to address a specific issue. Therefore, uh, remaining useful life forecasting remains sometimes ineffective um, unless a better decision and actions are taken based on information gains. My current um, Oh, my, my task currently at Imatech is to find out how we can find the root cause of a remaining useful life event, uh, meaning a remaining useful life forecasting can be defined as a regression problem, predicting the target value y, uh, t, t plus h. Uh, and also you can see on the picture on the bottom right that you have your target um, function or values and also your past covariates which will be used to predict the next um, target variable. Most of the time, it's a task of est estimating the remaining use for life uh, as a single horizon pr problem. So predicting a single horizon age is equal to, to one. Um, here, to, together with the prototype uh, engagement team from AWS Luxembourg and yeah, David's team, we are trying to create our first prototype together. Uh, here we are using a long short term memory model, uh, which estimates the remaining use for life. Um, if a specific threshold then is reached, is it compute the, the SHAP values to rank the fe fe uh, feature importance to give a troubleshooting suggestion. Uh, what are SHAP values? So, uh, yeah, the SHAP, -Li or SHAP values or SHAP additive. Ad Additive explanation is a game theoretic approach uh, to explain the outputs of any machine learning model. And it connects the optimal credit allocation with a local explanation using a classic Shapley values. Uh, the results of the first prototype you can see on the right hand side. So after you you forecasting that the machine will break in some minutes or hours, uh, we can rank uh, our features, so our sensors or variables in our data set which contributes the most to this upcoming issue. Um, but the, the, the problem here is, or yeah, but methods like SHAP 
in general will provide limited uh, explainability as they can only used or can only be used with already trained models uh, like machine or deep learning models and the methods like shep or lime for example are only explaining the past and not trying to anticipate what the model may do in the, f uh, in the future uh, therefore they they tell us what features are associated with the prediction but not what features tries the outcome and in the context of a causal inference root cause analysis is primarily used to determine what factors or sequences uh, of events lead to an observed outcome so for for Imatech or for for my phd project so far it is important to understand what uh, parameters, what sensors, what processes lead actually to the to the problem, because otherwise you cannot help the the operator or technician uh, in the product in the production line, and he cannot fix the upcoming issue before it occurs, or he can even not prepare for an upcoming issue. He still watches that the machine learning model is forecasting the machine will break, and then if you do not uh, do something, it will break. Therefore, uh, to optimize the overall equipment effectiveness, uh, we need a fast root cause analysis uh, of, of faults. And what is very important is that correlation approaches often fail, mean they are unable to understand the cause and effect within the data, and they are missing, as I said, explain, explainability uh, from domain experts. Therefore, to uh, develop causal inference, you need to perform, first of all, a human guided causal discovery, which is which, or which you can see here on the top left. It's a small causal graph, which we created based on our uh, manufacturing process at Imatech and how we think the variables and processes are linked to each other. Um, therefore, you use a combination of domain knowledge and the causal um, discovery algorithm to uncover the causal rel relationships within the past data which you um, sampled. The second point is the causal modeling. Here you try to understand the functional relationship between each of the nodes and the branches or the connections. In the third point, uh, you will might perform a root cause analysis and here you run interventional or counterfactual analysis to identify exactly what is the root cause based on your data and your causal graph. And with this information, you can then uh, perform a process optimization and use the, the model results to understand the cause of the faults. Uh, and you can deploy this uh, in real time connected to your production machine or production line. So both methods, which I mentioned here, the interventional and also the counterfactual, um, try to determine the causes by finding out which variable, when set to a control value, turns to an unfavorable result into a favorable one. <laughs> so um, this was it from my side. So if you have any questions or concerns or whatever, uh, feel free to contact our team or me. So you can contact e either myself or Professor Thomas Engel or Professor Fazl Ansari from the Technical University of Vienna. Okay, three, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Felix. Uh, that's a very interesting presentation. Um, you, if you have questions, please write to them on the chat. Um, I will give you a few, few minutes to write them on the chat, but Felix, before audience write them on the chat, I would, uh, I would like to ask you uh, one question, basic one. Uh, in your experience, what do you think the major data sources are in the, in, in the shop floor? Um, yeah, it depends uh, really on your production line, but in our case, um, the environmental data is really important like environmental conditions like temperature humidity or moisture because it's changing our or could change our process but i think a good way to start is um, to simply if you have a large production line or a large machine focus on a very small part of the machine like a maybe a, a sub process or sub component and start there with one three or maybe ten sensors 
which you think are relevant uh, and, and, and yeah, relevant to your process. But I would say uh, environmental and uh, environmental conditions and also your sensor data, which are measuring actually things which happens in the machine, like pressure, vibration signals, yeah, things like that. Yeah, to, um, following up that question, let's say a lot of companies in the shop floors have PLCs already controlling their machines. Uh, but how do you think that without going for a retrofit, how do you think that companies can leverage the already existing PLC data, which is not actually stored or not actually used for predictive maintenance? Do you think there's a possibility or is it? Uh, it yeah, it sure. Is, yeah. So that's ex exactly the case at Imatech. They have a PLC or they use PLC to control their production lines, but that's the important thing. They use it to control it. And uh, we develop now a data logger, which samples data from our machine, um, which could be done if you have like a back off system or a Siemens system. It's, um, I would say, not easy to develop a data logger, but you can, you can do it. And based on this, uh, you can easily um, log manufacturing data from your sensors, put it into a specific file format, like a CSV or a text format, text file. And then the data scientist or the data engineer could use them to, to, to move on for further things like cloud connection, training a model or yeah, uh, investigation. Okay. Uh, I still don't see any questions from the audience. That brings me to my final question then, uh, which would be a more about um, explainability and trust of the models. Yes, we, let's say in, in analytics, I use a model that I borrowed from other developers somewhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. How often do I need to check the reliability of the model? How often do you recommend training uh, for training the model again after checking the reliability? So you can, um, once you deploy the model in, in production, you can track some metrics um, uh, like basically an error, which, which you can check um, what your current model is performing and what your last model is performing. And you can set there, or we, we want to set there a threshold. Uh, once the model starts to get worse, you should directly retrain it on the, on the new um, data you gained through, through the, the manufacturing process. So I cannot recommend directly how often you need to retrain, but um, at least one, once a month or maybe all three months, you should retrain the model to, uh, to avoid drifts or degradation in, in performance. Okay. Well, we still have time for one question. We have already seen a question by Pavel Moraru. Um, what do you think could be done about the feedback loops towards teaching the AI models to narrow down the possible causes based on the human expertise? So, okay. Um, it depends what model you mean, but for example, if you're using um, a structural graph, like I showed in my um, last slide, you can basically model or use the human in the feedback loop to um, bring domain knowledge into the AI system. But if you have um, just like a machine learning model, like an XG boost or LSTM model, um, you can also bring the operator or technician in the loop, because if your model is predicting something wrong, uh, you might have the chance to correct the model and say, no, 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 this is, this is wrong. Uh, there's no issue. And you can use this information once you uh, retrain the model, as I said, once a month or however you, you, um, you want to do it. Uh, you can use this information to retrain the model and to improve the accuracy. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Uh, thanks for your time answering the questions. We still have 40 seconds to go. I would tell you one, I will ask you one last thing. What would you suggest if the companies are starting to transition to predictive maintenance? What is one thing that you suggest the companies to do? I would start with a very, very small project and with a very simple algorithm uh, to see the what you can do with the complete transition into industry 4.0 mm -hmm. and not starting with a uh, with a large data collection, uh, very hard to un understand model and stuff like that. So I would start very, very small, 
with a very easy use case to first explore what we can do and what not. And the most important thing is, um, of course, the data and you, you should spend um, most of the time in getting the right data in a good quality. Thank you, Felix. Right data and good quality is something take away from this presentation. And thank you so much, Felix, for your time. And uh, I will look forward to the next speaker now. Uh, that's an exciting presentation. That brings me to my second poll. What are the biggest barriers to adapting predictive maintenance in your organization? So this would be the second poll. The poll is live on interactivity. So go to the poll and please answer what do you think are the biggest barriers to adapt PM in your organization? While you answer, I can tell you from the last poll, uh, I could clearly see that there are two main problems, uh, challenges that companies face related to manufacturing equipment. Those are minimizing the maintenance cost and preventing the unplanned downtime. So. Let's go ahead and answer this poll about predictive maintenance barriers in your company. Yeah, I hope the live, uh, poll is live. Please, get, please get your answers in. Yes, I see they are being populated. You could clearly see. Yeah. While you are answering the poll, I would introduce our next presenters. I would uh, simply call these two people as data magicians. The reason being they convert the data that is raw and unexplainable sometimes to something useful, which means converting the data to information the companies can use in their maintenance or other, other decision making. So today we have Marcelo and Dorian from University of Luxembourg associated with ST. They both are doctoral researchers and today they are going to present their project about maintenance optimization at Chebby, Luxembourg. So Dorian and Marcelo, the floor is yours, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure I, I'll make sure keep an eye on the questions, and I'll ask questions at the end of your presentation. Thank you very much, Sri. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Marcelo Ruiz, and I'm here with my colleague, Doria. We both are uh, PhD students from the University of Luxembourg, and together we will be presenting the topic maintenance optimization at SEBI Luxembourg. Uh, the main idea of our talk today is to present you the research directions that we are following to improve the maintenance process at SEBI Luxembourg. So, uh, first of all, we are... Uh, from the SNT, it's a research center from the University of Luxembourg with different research groups. Uh, Dorian and I part of the security and validation, it's called CERVAL. And SEBI is a manufacturing electromechanical uh, a company that produces ma mainly for the automotive and household appliance industries, and it's our industrial partnership. So we are going to go through uh, three main blocks the maintenance scheduling optimization the first block the at the bottom we see the remaining useful life and we are going to finalize with the knowledge extraction so first i'm going to talk about the maintenance scale and optimization so for the maintenance scale optimization we had three main inputs is the maintenance tickets the historical data from sevi we have also information about the technicians and the objectives so the, the tickets, the first uh, input, is basically the historical maintenance data that we have at SEBI. We use this information for our, our optimization process. Using also this information, we uh, get some information about the technicians, uh, their skills, their qualifications, 
And for the optimization, we need to define what are the objectives. So in this case, we are mainly working with two objectives. That is the max span, is the time elapsed at the beginning of the first intervention to the last intervention. Also, we are working with the total time to, that takes to complete all the interventions. And this is called the, the time to repair. We also define other objectives as the priority and to optimize the, based on some sectors. Uh, but we are going to talk today just about the, the first objectives. The main idea of the optimization is based on the, on the tickets, the intervention that needs to be performed. How can we allocate the different technicians to complete these interventions following the, the objectives uh, to reduce the max span or to reduce the total time to repair? Based on this, we can have an optimized scale. The first thing that we done is analyze the historical maintenance data saving. So at the screen, we can see a small snapshot. There are many other columns. Here we are just presenting a few ones. So the main idea is that we have from the historical data, which technicians perform the different maintenance tasks uh, at which machine. And we define some failure based on uh, some sector and station number from the machines. And we also have some timestamp, the date of the maintenance and the time of the maintenance and the duration of the maintenance. Based on this, we can extract different features. For example, we have the duration. We can know what was the time to repair. We can also extract some information about uh, the time between failures when uh, maintenance was performed and the same machine, the same failure happened again for the time between failures. And we can use these this, uh, KPIs for other purposes. So what we've done is that we took the time to repair for the different technicians. And we use this information as a different skill. So we know which technician is performing better for a particular type of failure. Um, and since we know the, uh, based on these skills, um, we also, when we want to optimize, we know the different interventions that needs to be done. And we define the two objectives, the mix span and the time to repair. And if we follow the bottom line, we do the optimization and we obtain an optimized schedule. And we can compare with an artificial historical schedule since from the historical data, we know which technician was assigned to the different um, maintenance tasks and what time it, um, the, the duration of the maintenance. We compare this historical schedule with the optimized schedule that we perform to have some evaluation. So at SEBI, we perform um, this historical data per week from 2010 to 2021 with our optimization process. And we improve around 35% for the max span and around 38% for the time to repair. This is equivalent to 17 and 65 hours per week, but it's not uh, equivalent to max span and the time to repair. So just to, uh, to repeat again, the max span is the total time since the first intervention to the last intervention. And the time to repair is if we allocate all the maintenance duration, uh, one above the other, that's the total time to repair. We are going to follow with the second research direction that we are following, is the remaining useful life for predictive maintenance. Thank you, Marcelo. So um, I'm going to present you how we can use remaining useful life uh, according for our optimization problem. Uh, I. I think um, Felix did a really great job for presenting remaining useful life and predictive maintenance. So for the uh, next part, I will just go for the big picture. So <clears throat> actually, um, just to give you some insight of how we can build the remaining useful life according to data or to the machine, let's suppose that we have a machine that is producing some part for an industry. From this machine, we can extract a health curve that represents this, uh, basically the, how the machine is doing. So it's really simple to understand where we are at one, the machine is performing really well. Uh, where we are at zero, the machine is failing. So for this curve, you can see that there is a plateau at first, so the life is very good. Uh, in during the life of the machine, when it's producing pieces, we encounter some degradation. After the degradation, the health of the machine is decreasing until we have a failure. So when we have a, a failure in, um, in a machine, uh, maintenance action needs to be performed, so the machine is stopped because it's failing. The production, it requires time, technician, uh, and money. The thing is, if uh, we are able to know, um, you can pass Marcelo. 
if we are able to know where we are on the curve, we can estimate how much time there will be before the failure. So you can see the green point here representing the current uh, state of the machine. We can estimate the duration between um, the points and uh, the failure. So you can see on the, for example, here that the, the, the remaining is life is zero because uh, we are reached the failure. In practice, when dealing with remaining use for life and predictive maintenance, uh, technician um, and industrial fixed a threshold. And when the health of the machine uh, crossed this threshold, maintenance is performed. This is called the predictive maintenance. And this is how we can use remaining use for life for predictive maintenance. Doing predictive maintenance um, minimize um, the maintenance uh, frequency, it saves the, produ the, the production of bad parts. So it keeps your machine producing a good parts. Problem is where, uh, how to know where we are on that curve. Actually, to uh, predict where uh, and know where we are on that curve, you need information about machine. As Felix said, information can be sensors, for example, temperature, vibration, or any kind of uh, re information related to the machine. And we can use all this information to feed uh, an artificial intelligence model that we try to predict where we are on that curve. For example, you can see on for the first point here, it, if the, the model predicts that we are here, the remaining use life is really high. If it predicts that we are on the degradation, the remaining use life is decreasing. And if we are on the, on the failure, it predicts that the machine is failing. So yes, you don't need an artificial intelligence model to predict that your machine is failing. But if it can predict that your machine is failing without even seeing the machine, it's a good start. So <clears throat> using remaining useful life uh, for the optimization of, um, of the scheduling is really interesting because you can predict when, if you can estimate when a machine is going to fail, you can automatically create a ticket that can be added to the optimization of the scheduling. And then when technician will have to perform their maintenance, they will be aware that <clears throat> this machine is supposed to fail in a few moments, so you need to perform the maintenance now. Now I would like to introduce you um, the third uh, research axis that we are focusing um, uh, at SNT with SEBI, which is the knowledge graph. So basically, um, the knowledge graph is a uh, the tool that permits us to extract um, information from maintenance tickets in order to help technicians to perform maintenance. So to introduce you to this uh, to, to this tool, uh, um, let's suppose that we have some uh, tickets. Uh, uh, you can see in blue here with the um, maintenance ticket. So you have the number, the machine, the date, uh, the ticket, the type of failure can be mechanical, electrical, or something else. But you also have a description that the technician fulfill when they are creating the tickets. For example, you can see the last line is pump beneath hood. So this um, database of tickets is raw data. And Knowledge Graph is a way to um, organize your data to smart data, to transform raw data to smart data. Actually, it do that creating relationships between uh, important information from maintenance tickets. Basically, you can see that the description, the last one is pump beneath uh, hood leaking. And by building this graph, you can have some relationships. For example, the machine uh, 791130 has the components pump, it has a problem leak, and what was the action to fix this problem? This tool can be used for many applications. Uh, for example, I think must yes. For example, um, if you want to ask questions, you can query the graph to, and use it as a kind of chat GPT for maintenance. If the man maintenance manager wants to know what machine has the highest downtime, you can query the graph and you will go through all the nodes for the downtime of each machine and you can uh, output some analytics. But it can also be used for technician. If some technician wants to know how do we usually fix this issue? If you fed into the model, the 10 uh, years historical data about maintenance, you will have the key insight of uh, the last 10 years, how technicians fix this issue. So for example, here it could be, uh, usually you replace the components. So I know it, the, the tool can, the, the knowledge graph can be quite complicated to understand, but I would like to show you that the, the concept is quite simple. Um, let's suppose that we have a small example, uh, Tim and his car. So Tim has, uh, has a car. He went several times to the mechanic last year because his car has trouble. 
each time he went to the mechanic shop, the mechanic guy took some invoice about uh, the problem. So what was the problem, the action done to fix the machine, the car information, such as the mileage, how full was the tank, or many other information, and also the cost. According to all this invoice, the mechanic guy can build um, a graph that looks like this. For example, you can see the car. The, the car has different components according to the different type of failure. So it could be the battery. The battery has some, um, the problem was the battery was dead. So you perform some action, which was the replacement, and you have the cost. In practice, if you have thousands and thousands of examples of this graph, you can build a more robust, trustworthy, and bigger graph that can help you to have more accurate information. Using this tool, you can build uh, many applications, uh, especially, for example, answer some questions. I think you can pass Marcelo. Yes, for example, if you want to know how much does it cost to replace a car battery, you will go to the car node, then to the battery node, then to the replacement node, then to the cost node. And like this, you can have like this travel of all the nodes to have an answer. You can pass Marcelo. So this knowledge graph is a tool, but you can use it for many applications. As I said, for example, a chat GPT for maintenance, you can use a large language model on the top of the knowledge graph to answer some questions. It could be how to fix this issue, have some analytics, but you can also use it for different fields. For example, the financial field, uh, if you want to know how much does it cost to, uh, to prepare for maintenance on this, uh, this slide, for example. So we want to get some key takeaways for the research direction that we are following at Seville Luxembourg. The first one is, as Felix also mentioned, high quality data is really important. It allows us to have an accurate predictive models to provide a decision maker with accurate information. We can also use it to estimate more accurate uh, failure distributions, intervention times, maintenance instructions, among other kind of information. The second one is that we are working on a decision support system. At the end, the decision is for the operator or the technician. And what we want to do is to enhance the performance of the technician by helping them to perform a better maintenance, not to replace them. And research drives innovation. Uh, it helps at the case, in this case at, at SEBI Luxembourg, to develop new methodologies and technologies that lead to more efficient and reliable cost-effective uh, maintenance strategies. And one thing, well, several, we learned several things through, through this work. But optimization is an iterative and adaptive process. It's interesting for our side to apply the theoretical knowledge to the practical industry. But we need to go step by step uh, to make the changes smoothly and to respect the existing uh, process that are at Seville Luxembourg. Uh, so we want to thank you for, for joining today. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Dorian. Uh, exciting presentation. I, I would uh, ask the audience to write their questions in the tab there. Uh, however, before they write, I have a couple of questions for you. I know it is really important to have the correct data uh, to, to actually give a proper response to a, a large language model as well. So how long did you collect this data related to maintenance tickets and which operator is doing the best performance for a specific fault. How long did you collect such data before actually um, deploying the knowledge graph? Uh, I think I can answer. So, so far the knowledge graph is not implemented okay. uh, at CB Luxembourg. We are working on it. And the difficult part is to gather the correct data. Uh, also to have the, the the quality of the data because some description might be not fulfilled well some information may be missing and so gathering this data is really complicated complex the thing is if you get the data from uh, 10 years ago and the machine is not available in the production it doesn't make sense to keep it actually so you need to really be careful about um what what data do you consider for your large language model uh, but also you need to have a lot of data. So this is like a, a two field problem. So you need to be careful about the data, but you need to ensure that the good data are still relevant today to feed your model. Mm -hmm. So it's complex. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, that brings down to the next question. You talked about a specific fault and mapping it with a specific operator or a maintenance personnel. 
is it something that uh, also you force you to implement the not uh, like fault which fault can be better managed by which operator for example this, so, so from the historical maintenance data, we know which intervention was performed for different technicians. And we can build some skills for these technicians, knowing the, the technicians already have some qualifications if they are going to fix electrical or mechanical components. But some technicians are, can be good at performing different uh, maintenance operations. And we did some of that analysis from the historical maintenance data to get an estimation of how long does it take for a particular technician to perform this maintenance on this type of failure. But also, uh, as, as we mentioned, data quality is really important. And there is an estimation of the maintenance duration that a technician perform, but there are other factors that affect this maintenance duration since what we want to estimate at the end is the, the range time of the technician. What is the real time that the technician is performing the maintenance? And there are several factors that can affect this maintenance duration as the technician can have some questions of who opened the ticket, uh, how to perform maintenance. And all of this is, um, is a maintenance duration that is prolonged, not just the, the real range time, the real time of the technician performing the maintenance. But most of it, we calculate it based on the historical maintenance data. Okay, uh, same question like Philips. What would be some best practices if some of our audience in the manufacturing companies would like to say take the same approach. What would you suggest some best practices? Uh, I, I, for in the case for the, for example, for historical maintenance data, I think one best one thing that is important to to improve is when a technician perform a maintenance, as Dorian mentioned, it's important to mention how was the the the, the instructions, the the operation that the technician performed, not just the, we fixed the, the machine and, and it's done. Uh, what was the process that the technician followed to fix this machine? So to improve this, the textual, textual description, also to have some different categories for the maintenance. So in this case, we are creating some, we know which machine failed, uh, which sector, which station number, but Maybe to have more precise information of this uh, could be important in the, in the case of the historical data. So to have a better categorization for this, it's also important. And we agree what Felix mentioned. Um, it's important to go step by step. For example, we have uh, this process of maintenance uh, scheduling optimization that we allocate to different technicians, but it's not to go from zero to implement that. So, okay, we can start First, suggesting which technician uh, is better to perform this maintenance, so an assignment of technician, and then we move on to, okay, so you have this uh, time slot to perform the maintenance. So it's going step by step. Uh, okay, first one assign, a suggestion of the assignment, then to have a particular uh, schedule, and so on. So it's step by step is a really part, important part of the process. Thank you, Marcelo and Dorian, for your... Uh patients answering my questions and please answer the questions of audience if they come forward in the chat. Um, thank you so much once again, and I will move on to the next stage of the webinar. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. So we have a special guest today joining us from uh, across the borders, Hari and Surendran. They, are, they represent MaxBite. They are our special guests for sneak preview today. So they will present. And if you have questions, directly write to them, to their emails, which they will soon publish on the discussion. So the presentation would be mostly on market outlook of digital trends, and the same time also predictive maintenance. So Hari and Surendran, the floor is yours, and good luck. Thank you, Sri, and uh, thank you for the other esteemed speakers. Uh, lovely, lovely speak, and good morning, everybody else. So uh, I'm going to quickly give you an overview of MaxByte, and then my colleague Surendran, he will just run through some of the case studies related to predictive maintenance. So MaxByte, what we do, we accelerate smart and sustainable industry transformation. That is our core business. We are about an eight-year-old company. We started with digitalization and then moved on to robotics. We have proven solutions and uh, implementations worldwide. 
So now the current focus, uh, we, are, we are exploring more on the green side, sustainability. That is the area we are currently also expanding into. So as I move on, uh, that's our goal. We are trying to digitize and robotize about 100,000 industrial enterprises by 2030. We uh, work in various verticals, aerospace, aerospace, automotive, energy utilities, food and beverages, are some of the verticals we work on. Then uh, stepping in a little bit more, uh, digitalization, uh, MaxByte has uh, about 60 plus apps. We have a what is a software application which is called the Byte Factory and predictive maintenance is one of the modules uh, within, within the Byte Factory app. And then within robotizations, we have uh, autonomous mobile robots where we also uh, kind of retrofit an existing manual robots uh, as well as uh, uh, we, we work with the, uh, the the manufacturers as well. The newer area, which is to do with decarbonizations, which is which is more in the initial stages, we are also working uh, with the assessment and net zero transition solutions. That's the other area, and the core core of our our area is also the adoption, where we provide training and uh, create awareness programs in collaboration with various various industrial bodies. So. Moving on, uh, like I said, we are about eight year old company and uh, these are some of the statistics we have. Uh, we have worldwide implementations of uh, 50 plus factories and about 100 plus projects. We operate globally in five regions and what we have basically observed is we have seen that industry 4.0 maturity adoption is less than 20 percent. There is a lot of scope, a lot of improvement uh, in this area. Some of our customers, um, where what we follow is we have different phases. Discovery phase is where we do some initial assessment and then we, we, we do uh, what we call as proof of value, where we try and identify a few uh, use cases based on our assessments and then we implement our solutions. Then we move, move on to a slightly bigger uh, implementation where it could be a factory wide or it could be a department wide implementations. Some of our customers there worldwide, uh, some big names around we work with uh, globally. So I'll, we'll be sharing these presentations if, if there's more details uh, on, on the other stuff you need. So now I just request uh, Surendran to uh, get dwell more into the predictive maintenance aspect, which is, which is the main focus of this, this webinar. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Eddie and uh, good morning all. Um, so, uh, uh, coming back uh, to our uh, core business functions, as I mentioned in the previous slides, we primarily focus on four different domains where digital is one of the major category. Um, uh, so, we uh, wanted to uh, go as per the industrial digital uh, uh, framework, uh, so assessing the factories on what are the current level they are in on the digital solutions and how they can move up in their ladder in the digital maturity framework. So uh, basically, there will be six levels of um, uh, six levels uh, we follow for a digital uh, maturity uh, roadmap or maturity framework. Where the first two levels will be the computerization connectivity, so where we can able to connect the data machines or connect uh, any utilities inside the factories and able to get the data. The third level will be the visibility stage, where we can able to see uh, what is happening in the system. And the fourth level will be the transparency stage. Uh, so users can able to see why it is happening in the system and the fifth level will be the predictive stage so we can with the help of the data that we have gathered from the level three and level four we can able to predict what will happen in the future and the sixth level will be like kind of autonomous uh, function where the system starts behaving itself in like kind of autonomous machine uh, it can recommend itself uh, based on the anomalies that is detected uh, from the machines or utilities uh, so one such uh, functionality that we want to more develop on in this today's session is on the predictability or predictive aspects of uh, either it can be any it can be any assets matter of fact inside the factory either it can be a machine or it can be a material handling equipment or it can be utility like our uh, compressors dryers ctp stp plants or dg sets uh, anything inside the factory so how uh, the life of these uh, machines or these utilities can be uh, monitored when we help of the data that we are going to get from the system, how this break to maintenance can be enabled so it makes the maintenance uh, the teams work uh, much much more uh, easier or their life easier. 
and also we also want to have this predictability on the products that goes out of the uh, factory say for example uh, uh, chillers or any other in fact for any other machines that goes to the customer sites so before customer comes to the oem and say uh, your machine has failed can the oem predict the failure of the machines so this is one of the other aspects that we are also working on so uh, in that in that respect we want to just present two quick use cases uh, which you also done on it um, so before that uh, i just want to touch upon um, where this spirit to maintenance will be having an impact uh, likewise uh, right from the uh, shop floor to the top floor uh, there will be different set of operations or different set of verticals or teams that will be operating so the management and corporate services uh, uh, where they will primarily focusing on the strategic alignment and also on the strategic planning and the engineering side where uh, primary focus is on the uh, empowering the designs and also on the quality of the products and major in the operation side where the production will be taking place and the maintenance and the quality will be a key aspect and coming to the support services uh, the other services like procurement finance uh, or logistics so everything will be coming into picture where this particular project to maintenance can have a big uh, footprint as well so this is something um, uh, we want to just capture uh, where all this project to maintenance will play a major role and coming up to the use case as i mentioned uh, so this is the first i want to just touch upon uh, where we have done this uh, the energy analytics and maintenance to an automobile industry uh, so we capture uh, the energy data and based on that uh, uh, the potential production data and based on that one we are trying to <coughs> find the anomalies and also we try to correlate the production and the energy data and try to predict what will be the production or what will be the energy consumption down the line so this is one such insights for the inside the shop floor uh, where we can able to do for any kind of uh, machines or any kind of uh, assets so the first and foremost step is to enable the condition monitoring for those machines or utilities so either with help of the plc based data or with help of some sensors data that we can retrofit in the machine or utilities we can able to capture the data so where we are going to capture the failure data as well and then predict this particular energy consumption production consumption so with this we have articulated the complete end to end architecture of the project to maintenance also so where we will be having our uh, otit otit convergence will come into picture so where we get the data where we have iot platform um we process the data and over the top of the iot platform we will be having the machine learning or ml based platform which will be able to get the already history data as well as well as the live data from the machines uh, for uh, to enable the prediction of those particular machines or utilities so in this aspect only the second use cases also lies where uh, we enable the spread to maintenance for the chillers uh, so uh, so this is for one of the customers where they have around 500 chillers installed across the country and they want to predict the time to failure for each chiller based upon the 3 years or 2 uh, to 3 years of uh, failure data they have it so based on that we can so and also we want to monitor the live data as well so we connected those chillers and based on the history data we have created that ml model and then uh, we fed both the history data as well as the live data inside the model and we can able to predict the time to failure for each and every chiller that is operating based on the diagnostic conditions and the parametric conditions uh, um, which is being offered uh, to us and then we can able to uh, uh, calculate multiple failure conditions and multiple modes of failures as well and where we could able to achieve around um, say 80 to 85 percent of accuracy in our prediction as well so this has helped the customers uh, our oems uh, majorly uh, to uh, plan their uh, scheduled maintenance and also the preventive maintenance suffer so that in case they see any failures they can easily uh, ensure that their uh, product is not failing and is always up and running 24 by 7 so this is one such of uh, uh, use case that we are currently working on and lot of project to maintenance activities inside the shop floor with help of a uh, uh, key data like vibration uh, pressure and temperature where we can able to uh, predict the failures or useful life of uh, the machines uh, also now we have been uh, working with uh, our lot of customers as well so in like in, in line with that one we have this the tfs training programs as well where it will give an awareness sessions and also we try to make championship in this industry 4.0 domain and also several certification programs on <laughs> various technologies in this industrial iot uh, 
program as well so that is a quick overview which i uh, which we want to share about for today's session and uh, if you want to have any detailed discussion or any deep dive into any of the solution uh, please uh, feel free to reach us at uh, uh, our email address will be more than happy to assist you thank you thank you Sreen. thank you thank you hari and thank you surendran for your talk and please do reach out to them if you have any questions uh, i would uh, bring this webinar to uh, closure now with one last poll this poll is about uh, if your if the webinar has met your expectations or not this is also for us to improve what kind of topics you are looking forward to in future take 30 seconds and please answer those uh, those uh, the last question and that would really help us And I could briefly tell you in the second uh, poll, people were the barriers for predictive maintenance are mostly availability of data, lack of resources, also the accessibility of data. Um, some people also commented, I mean, lack of resources and skills gap is almost uh, the same amount of responses we, we collected. So, yeah, good to see that uncertainty in ROI is also a problem. Yeah, I agree. I agree with these answers and uh, there is something to address. Thanks for your responses. Um, by this, I would like to thank you all the speakers as well as all the audience and also from the manufacturing uni manufacturing enterprises in Luxembourg and beyond. Also students who joined from University of Luxembourg, all the researchers who also joined uh, to our webinar today. I wish you all a happy festive season and uh, good luck in new year with all the predictive maintenance projects that you're going to do. Thank you so much and see you in the new year. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.